Hey, Damien here from The Speed of Sound and Seawater. It's been like five years since we've played a show, and over the last few months, I've been relearning a lot of Speed of Sound songs, so I thought this might be a cool time to show you guys how some of the riffs were written and give you some ideas for your own playing. People ask me like every two weeks whether I'm gonna write tabs for a particular song, and honestly, the answer is, I probably will never want to do that. It's just so time consuming. And secondly, I don't actually believe that tablature is the best way to learn your instrument. Um, it's how I started playing guitar. And to be quite honest, I wish I had begun learning guitar a different way because I think I'd be even a little further ahead right now. That's just me personally. There's a thousand ways to go about learning the guitar. I think a foundational knowledge of music theory is a much better way to go about figuring out riffs by ear rather than kind of plugging and playing using this like paint by number system. It just doesn't really leave much room for understanding of what we're playing. Okay, so without further ado, I want to emphasize that a lot of these riffs center around this like open G major position on the neck. The first one I'm going to talk about is the huge wheel because it's probably the one that the most people have seen me play on YouTube. It's just the open G major position with the capo on the fourth fret and honestly the whole riff just centers around this like G major 7 position and this uh, this like D shape right here. Not your open D but like this fretted D major shape. So it's as though you're outlining your G major 7 in two different positions. You're kind of outlining this open position and landing on this position and then the D major shape. And there's some extra flavors in there and like the other parts of the song as it progresses, but it is always alternating between I think the hardest part of this riff for people is probably like um, this weird chicken picking thing that happens this song. The thing I really like about chicken picking using your your plectrum and your thumb and forefinger and then like finger picking with your other three fingers is you can add all of this extra syncopation. All I'm doing is scooping out two of my top notes while alternating between the bass note. And just the interplay of the bass line with like this treble part just allows you to subdivide time more in a way that doesn't sound like like kind of a clusterfuck of of uh, notes in one register. So just something to experiment with. Uh, with all these, I'll, I'll play them slow, but I'm not gonna ever tab it out. So here's, here's like the main chunk of the huge wheel. Another riff that I've been really happy to relearn that also centers around like a G major shape is uh, this tapping riff in Hot and Bothered by Space. When we're tapping on the neck, we want, we want like our impacts on the neck when we're fretting really hard, we want them to be like of an even velocity. When we tap, it's almost like we've turned the guitar into a like a keys instrument, where every strike of the key is really even in dynamics. So that's why we're kicking on like a distortion paddle or a compressor. Hot and Bothered by Space also starts on a G and also alternates with a D chord. As we've been relearning this one, Jordan, our other guitarist, pointed out that in the name our own constellations, in that part, 
the riff isn't playing the right chord. The riff in the recording alternates between a G and an A. But if we want it to fit with the vocal, it has to go like this. G. On constellations. D. B. So now when I play the riff live, I play it like this, with the correct bass note each time. We're gonna break this down rhythmically and that'll make it feel a little simpler. So all that's happening are 16th notes. We're just going And the subdivision never changes. We're always playing just constant 16th notes. And all you have to do is figure out where to land them. And we get this kind of rhythmic subdivision that feels energetic and busy. And most importantly, now that we're playing the right chords, moves uh in terms of tone and mood along with what's happening in, in the lyrics and the vocals. This song is about exploring space and like these, these enormous celestial bodies. So in my mind, this riff kind of evokes this like enormity um, and the scale of like being dwarfed by the universe. That sounds really profound, but it actually segues into what I want to talk about next which is this idea of word painting. So in music, word painting is the act of trying to evoke a lyric that is being sung within the music itself. So the best example I can think of is in Hot and Bothered by Space, when it's time to blast off and we go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. <laughs> That is the blasting off moment where we go ba, ba, ba. and it has to feel like a rocket taking off. When I picture it as I play, I imagine like shooting stars on every one of these little, little zipper sounds. So it goes. Each of those, each of those little zips is like, it's like a star or like a planet passing by your head. You're on the rocket ship and it has to feel like momentum. And, and you know, some of that is up to the other members of the band to convey that motion and that energy. But if you can do it on one guitar neck, you have really like economized the different instruments in the band and everybody else can kind of like play up that energy using their own instruments. So just to lend some ideas for your own songwriting practice. Another thing I want to talk about is deriving inspiration from other artists and sort of the ways that I've done that. Whenever somebody asks me what artist has been most influential to my own playing, I always say Joanna Newsom, which is not what people are expecting to hear because she's not a guitarist, she's a harpist, and she plays this like beautiful, dense, like Americana influenced folk. and I think the most important thing I've gotten from her music is her storytelling ability uh, across all the instrumentation, across her words, across her melodies. It all feels like it builds to this larger whole of whatever the story of the song being told is. Learning her heart parts on guitar forced me to learn how to play some interesting three over four patterns. The best example of Joanna Newsom's influence on my own music is in Dinner in a Movie, where I pretty much straight ripped off uh, her song The Sprout and the Bean. I think the bass note is moving in The Sprout and the Bean, but I was learning that song on guitar and I was like, well, this is kind of cool, but I could also take it to this different chord. Uh, and that's how I wrote the weird country moment in Dinner in a Movie.
think of this as encouragement to look to much different genres of music to get inspiration for whatever you're writing, be it math rock or indie rock or hip hop or R&B. Whatever you're doing, you can put elements of your favorite music into it, regardless of genre. Uh, what we're really trying to capture when we write music is emotion and energy and narrative. And there's no tool that is wrong to use. Uh, I think genre boundaries are dissolving anyways, as people online have access to all of human history's recorded music. So don't get too bogged down with throwing some weird finger picking country riff into the middle of your math rock song. It's nobody's keeping score. Nobody's gonna penalize you for any of those decisions. <coughs> Uh, the last piece of advice I want to leave you with is to write your riffs around chord progressions first. Let me use an example. If I have this F sharp right here, are you able to tell me what emotion that conveys? No, right? A single note is incapable of conveying mood or tone or emotion. But as we add in detail, like if I add in second note or third note or th fourth note now this picture starts to develop the same goes if we're writing a riff note by note and we're writing using individual notes rather than chords it's hard to convey mood to the listener if we don't ourselves know what the setting is so let me use an example from my own writing this song amy adams is written around this chord progression So all that's happening in this riff is I'm outlining those chords. As long as I'm getting back to each of these foundational chords, I'm able to set this mood, which to me sounds like pretty tragic and the descending nature of it, and it's so squirrely, but it kind of like, it kind of like whips you back into the beginning of the riff by its end. So it feels like this cyclical loop that you're sort of stuck in, and it's kind of hard to find the one because it's so slurried. I guess like as a general rule of thumb, think of your chords as conveying emotion and then the way you're subdividing time is conveying motion, if that makes sense. And the two combined together are a riff. And without one or the other, we've kind of missed the mark. I, th I think as guitarists, we sometimes have a tendency to write songs around riffs. I know I've, I'm super guilty of that. A lot of the Speed of Sound material is written that way. And it's something that I've steered away from with time. But it's not the worst way to write a song. And in fact, it can be quite compelling. But if we are not thinking about what ingredients we're actually working with, uh, motion and emotion, uh, as I've just coined, it's a little harder to tell where to go next. That's it for me. I can't really think of anything else to share. If there's any, if you have any questions, post them in the comments. Like, subscribe, check out patreon.com slash so much light if you're interested in more content like this. Uh, I'm having a really good time sort of sharing some of my knowledge through the years. I'm anything but an expert, uh, more of a jack of all trades. If you think I said something really dumb, I don't, I don't really care, um, but feel free to share it. Uh, yeah, thanks, bye. Come to the Speed of Sound shows. They're gonna be really fun.